Are you on the Zoom here? Yeah. Morning, everyone. Welcome to our Charlotte meeting. Um, we. Okay, perfect. So today we're lucky to have uh, Dr. Jared Zamperini talking to us about uh, malaria and pregnancy. Um, we are also very lucky to have him being here in pioneering obstetric medicine, one of the few hospitals in the country or in the continent that actually have an obstetric medicine department. So talking about a very important topic, uh, malaria and pregnancy, interesting for a couple of things that Jared will explain to us, also very important because uh, patients are more susceptible to malaria and also more susceptible to severe disease. So without taking any more of Jared's thunder, I'll hand over to him. So you have any more thunder? Yeah. I didn't pay you for it though, so. Okay, so yeah, um, I'm gonna talk about malaria specifically in pregnancy, but I'm gonna cover just a bit of malaria in general. So to start with a bit of history. So if like me, you were born in the late 1900s, this uh, picture will resonate with you. It is of course a mosquito trapped in amber from which they extracted dinosaur DNA and cloned dinosaurs in that documentary film, Jurassic Park. Um, of course, it didn't happen. But what did happen is this amber with mosquitoes trapped inside was found in the Dominican Republic. And they've dated it back to 20 million years ago. And it's a now extinct Culex mosquito with the now extinct Plasmodium dominicana inside it. And so this is probably the earliest Plasmodium species uh, that evolved into the Plasmodium species we know today. Malaria has quite an interesting history. And for a bit of excitement, we're going to talk a bit about history today. So starting about 10,000 years ago, when the agricultural revolution began, and this encouraged contact between humans and mosquitoes through processes of land clearing, uh, livestock, and then mixing of different human groups. At the same time, there were consequences of natural selection for sickle cell disease, thalassemias, um, and glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, or G6PD deficiency. And these are all blood disorders which confer a selective advantage against malaria infection. In about 2,500 BC, uh, the Greek historian Herodotus wrote about the builders of the Egyptian pyramids eating garlic to prevent miasma. They, of course, didn't know yet that mosquitoes uh, gave you malaria. And interestingly about ancient Egypt is uh, they've discovered that the pharaoh Tutankhamun died of malaria. In ancient Rome, Hippocrates spoke about the tertian and caution fevers that occur every three or every four days. And it's widely recognized that in ancient Greece, it, malaria was implicated in the decline of many city-state populations. Then we go to ancient China, 168 BC, where the Chinese physician Ge Hong wrote in a Chinese manuscript, I'm not gonna try and say it in Mandarin, but it's translated as the emergency prescriptions kept in one sleeve. So really an ancient up-to-date, but on paper. Um, and what they did is they recommended soaking the leaves of Ching Hao in cold water and expressing the bitter juice and drinking it to treat intermittent fever. That's important, remember that for later. In 500 AD, Roman fever, as it was called, uh, affected Roman city of Campania and the city of Rome itself. And they also think that malaria contributed to the decline in the Roman empire. Going on to some popes, in 835 AD, Pope Gregory IV moved All Saints Day, which is now held on the 1st of November, moved it from uh, summer to winter, and that was because it was probably one of the first public health, uh, big public health measures, and it was to, uh, on practical grounds, that Rome in summer could not accommodate the great number of pilgrims who flocked to it and died. This chap is, known, is called Leonardo Bruni. He wrote in his Historiarum Florentini Populi Libri in 1476 AD. Uh, for some of them, it appeared most useful and necessary to reduce the army, more so as it was extremely stressed by disease and bad air. Of course, it's better in the original Italian, which I'm not going to read to you, but you see there the first use of the term mala aria or bad air, which is where our term malaria comes from. We've moved back to some popes. Pope Urban VII died of malaria just 12 days into, into his papacy, and he was the 21st of 99 popes to be affected by malaria between 1000 and 644 AD, and of those 21 popes, 15 of them died from malaria. Read into that what you will. 
In about 1640 AD, Jesuit priests established trade routes to transport Kinchona bark from Peru to Europe. Of course, before they arrived, the Spanish arrived, quinine was already known to the Quechua, the Canari, and the Chimu people um, to treat intermittent fevers. And by 1677, this bark was listed by the Royal College of Physicians in its London Pharmacopeia as an official medicine to treat patients with fever. 300 years after Bruni spoke about Mala Aria, uh, this guy by the name of Horace Walpole wrote in a letter back to England about a horrid thing called malaria that comes to Rome every summer and kills one. So really, Rome was a bad place to be when malaria was still around in Italy. Then in 1820, two Frenchmen, Pierre-Joseph Pelletier and Joseph Cabin II, managed to actually separate the alkaloids of kinchinine and quinine from powdered fever tree bark, which meant that for the first time, specific doses of quinine could be given instead of just drying the bark, grinding it to a powder and drinking it in wine to treat malaria. I take my chances with the wine personally, but I suppose quinine is better. So then, interestingly, between 1848 and 1861, the British government spent the equivalent of 6.4 million pounds each year to import kinchona bark to store for its troops. Much like COVID vaccine hoarding that we saw a few years ago, this is what the British did. And as a result, quinine is cited as one of the major tools of imperialism because the British Empire could go around to Africa, Southeast Asia, and not die of malaria. This chap is called Charles Louis Alphonse Laveran. In 1848, he first identified parasites in the blood of patients infected with malaria. He called it Ocellaria malaria, and he noted that quinine removed the parasites from blood. Fast forward a little bit, this is Sir Ronald Ross. He discovered that malaria was transmitted by mosquitoes and that event is now commemorated as World Mosquito Day. We're getting close to, closer to modern day, 1937, Johann Andersag synthesized a chemical called resochin, which was later renamed as chloroquine. And that was quite revolutionary in treating malaria until chloroquine stopped working for malaria. This person is Tu Yu Yu. She won the Nobel Prize for discovering artemisinin. And I told you to remember Cheng Hao. What her team did is they looked at 2,000 Chinese herb preparations. They eventually made 380 extracts from 200 different herbs. And they discovered that Cheng Hao worked, and, but it was variable in its efficacy. Until they went back to that book I told you about, The Medicines Up Your Sleeve, and a handful of Ching Hao impressed, immersed in two liters of water, wring out the juice and drink it all. And they managed to do that and extract artemisinin, which we use today to treat malaria. 2021, the WHO approved Moscorix or RTSS, the first malaria vaccine. And then the WHO made me change my slides four days ago when they approved Oxford R21 matrix M malaria vaccines. So that's the second malaria vaccine that has been approved. So this slideshow is as up-to-date as it can be. Right, so you've all got a history lesson. You're a bit interested now in malaria. We'll talk a little bit about epidemiology. This, as you know, is the world. And you can see there, malaria incidence is really focused on Africa. 90% of malaria cases occurring on our continent, some in Southeast Asia. But closer to home, malaria areas are the northern parts of Limpopo, the east, northeastern parts of Limpopo, the eastern parts of Mpumalanga, and then the eastern parts of KwaZulu-Natal. When we talk about malaria, we talk about stable and unstable areas of transmission. So areas of stable transmission, so that's your Central Africa, they have year-round transmission of malaria, which means that population has higher levels of immunity to malaria and lower peripheral parasitemia when they are infected with malaria. Whereas in areas of unstable transmission, such as South Africa, we don't have malaria in our winter months. You have seasonal epidemic transmission, it means people have lower levels of immunity and they have a very heavy peripheral parasitemia when infected by malaria. If we go on to malaria deaths, so in 2021, there were 247 million cases of malaria worldwide with an estimated 619,000 deaths. And as you can see, again, malaria deaths are focused on Africa, so much so as if you put it into this graph, the purple is deaths from malaria in Africa, and the rest is the rest of the world. So we really are the most afflicted by this disease. And one more cool picture to show it. 
This is the world with each territory um, resized according to the relative proportion of the world's population. And this next slide is worldwide distribution of malaria cases. So you can see Africa is really very affected by malaria and malaria deaths as well in Africa with some happening in Southeast Asia. And then just to South Africa quickly, as important as malaria is, it is not a major cause of mortality in South Africa. Malaria cases and deaths spiked in 2000. This is probably due to a decrease in insecticide and treatment efficacy. Around that time, we lost sulfadoxine pyrimethamine, uh, which definitely contributed. But then from 2001, a few things happened. One is South Africa, Swaziland, and Mozambique got together, and they put together regional malaria control strategies. And of course, artemisinin containing combination therapy, coartem was introduced into our EDL, which we started using to treat malaria. So much so that between 2018 and 2021, uh, which is not shown on this graph, there were only 242 malaria deaths in total over those years. So now the exciting stuff, pathophysiology. If anyone's writing part ones, pay attention. You will be asked this question. So there are five different species of plasmodium uh, that we know of. Plasmodium falciparum is the most virulent, and unfortunately, it's the most prevalent in Africa. Vivax and ovale. Vivax is the most widely spread, uh, but both Vivax and ovale can cause relapsing infections or relapsing malaria. Malaria is causes very mild disease, and Nolesi was only discovered in 2010. It was a monkey malaria parasite, but it does affect humans, but only in Southeast Asia for now. So everyone will know and remember this life cycle of malaria. So we're going to zoom in. The mosquito bites its human host, and sporozoites invade the host liver and then infect hepatocytes. In the hepatocytes, they mature into schizons, which I'm told by Dr. Murray is the correct way to pronounce them, not another way, as you can imagine. Uh, they then rupture and release merozoites into the bloodstream. Uh, Vivax has this dormant phase where the sporozoites develop into hypnozoites and can then remain dormant and reinfect or, or become sporozoites later. Once these merozoites are released into the blood, they infect red blood cells, mature into ring stage or immature trophozoites, they mature into mature trophozoites, and then back into schizonts, which are released back into the blood. This cycle here is responsible for clinical symptoms. The immature trophozoites can also mature into male and female gametocytes, which are then taken up by the malaria parasite at the next blood meal. And in the... Um, in the mosquito, the sporogonic cycle occurs where microgametes or male gametes and macrogametes, female gametes, generate zygotes, they elongate, become motile. These are known as eukinetes. They invade the mosquito gut wall, develop into oocysts, sporozoites again, and those are then released the next time the mosquito takes a blood meal. So that's the malaria cycle. This is important because drugs work on different, different points in the cycle, and it's also important because you're going to get asked it in the exams. So we've spoken enough about malaria. Let's talk about pregnancy. This quote comes from a 2020, 20, uh, sorry, 2001 article. So long as woman has walked the earth, malaria may have stalked her. And as much as this is true, the first case of malaria in pregnancy was only reported in the late 1800s. But we know now that 125 million women are at risk for contracting malaria. Of those, about 32 million women live in sub-Saharan Africa. And malaria accounts for about 10,000 maternal deaths per year, that's related to infection itself, but also the anemia that it causes, and 200,000 neonatal deaths per year due to growth restriction, preterm delivery, and then low birth weight and extremely low birth weight babies as well. So I've shown you the slide already, but what's important is the difference in malaria and pregnancy in areas of stable and unstable transmission. So in areas of stable transmission, there's a much higher prevalence of placental malaria, low and unstable transmission, Primogravity are at greatest risk in areas of stable transmission. I'll explain why a bit later. All pregnant women are at risk in areas of unstable transmission. So focus on this side. This is South Africa. All pregnant women are at risk, and there's less placental involvement than in areas of stable transmission. But all pregnant women are at greater risk of malaria infection for three reasons. The first is altered immunity. As you know, during pregnancy, there is a um, preference towards humoral immunity rather than cell-mediated immunity, and that's to protect the baby who has paternal antigens that the mom's immune system would otherwise take down. Cell-mediated immunity, though, is important for treating or for um, 
immunity against encapsulated organisms, of which plasmodium is one. There's also an increased attractiveness to mosquitoes. So mosquitoes like pregnant women. And this is quite a cool study that was done in 2000. These researchers took six different houses. They took six women, three were pregnant, three weren't. And they put them into the houses. They gave them malaria prophylaxis and mosquito nets. And they then saw every night how many mosquitoes there were in each hut to estimate the relative attractiveness of each woman. They repeated this three times with each group. Um, with 12 different groups, which I think is a quite a cool study. And what they showed is that there were twice as many Anopheles mosquitoes in the huts of pregnant women than in the huts of non-pregnant women. So 6.3 versus 3.1. Can you imagine being the research assistant on your knees trying to pick up dead Anopheles mosquitoes? What they also showed, though, is that pregnant women have about 21% more exhaled breath than their non-pregnant counterparts. And this is probably what attracts the mosquitoes. So it's uh, moist convection currents, host odors, um, you know, different chemicals in breath of humans. And then during pregnancy, pregnant women are 0.7 degrees warmer than non-pregnant women, which they also showed in their study. So if you're pregnant, you're more likely to be bitten by a mosquito. And then the placental changes are important. So those are red blood cells. On the surface of red blood cells that are infected with plasmodium species, you get plasmodium falciparum erythrocyte membrane protein 1. It's a large protein and it's key in the virulence of the malaria parasites. What it does is it allows the red blood cell that's infected to bind to the wall of blood vessels. So it's P-selectin, ICAM-1 and CD36 are involved. This helps these red blood cells evade splenic clearance and it then contributes to later release of the parasites in the blood. What is important though, PFEMP1 is coded by 60 different VAR genes in the, plasmodium, in the plasmodium parasite. And of these, one gene specifically, VAR2CSA, is very important in pregnancy. This is the placenta. This area here is known as the intervillous space. And on the lining of the intervillous space is something called chondroitin sulfate A, or CSA. This has a lot of functions in terms of normal placentation, it plays a role in adherence of the placental cells in the maternal uterine wall. It is part of the glycosaminoglycan matrix, which helps protect the fetus from harmful agents in maternal blood. It plays a role in nutrient and waste exchange, but also it is really liked by red blood cells that express VAR2 CSA. And if you look at this pink and purple over here, the white is the intervillous spaces. That's a fetal blood vessel, chorionic villus. But when infected with malaria, it gets packed full of infected red blood cells. So you can see there's really no intervillous space left there. The problem with this is this placental sequestration of infected red blood cells leads to placental malaria, which is inflammation of the placental tissue. Inflammation is bad. There's impaired maternal fetal exchange. You can see those intervillous spaces just packed full of malaria parasites. So there's limited exchange of oxygen, nutrients, and waste products between mom and fetus. And this increased parasite density leads to decreased splenic clearance. So all of your infected red blood cells are sitting nicely in the placenta. Your spleen can't do its job and get rid of those parasites. In addition to all pregnant women being at greater risk of infection, certain or specific pregnant women are also at greater risk. In areas of stable transmission, that's your primary gravity and your younger woman. The reason for that is if you haven't been infected with malaria before during pregnancy, you have not had red blood cells expressing VAR2 CSA, which means you do not have antibodies to it. In the second trimester, there's thought to be um, altered splenic function, which also affects uh, risk of infection. So second trimester is the highest risk, and that's true in areas of unstable transmission as well. But as I mentioned earlier, all gravidities in our area are at risk. Then women living with HIV, this is quite interesting. If you look at this graph, it's, it's quite confusing, but this here is malaria prevalence. The black is with no interaction between malaria and HIV. The red is with interaction. This is HIV prevalence, and this is dual infection. And what these very clever people did using statistics is they showed that from 1980 to 2006 or 2005, 2006, the interaction between malaria and HIV led to 8,500 excess HIV infections and 980,000 excess malaria episodes in this area. So consider that you know, pregnant women with HIV are at greater risk of malaria. 
I did not go into viral load CD4 and specific community, but, and this was in 2006, so a bit before ARBs. What about the effect of pregnancy on malaria? So we know they're more likely to be infected, but they're also more likely to have severe malaria. This is from the NICD guidelines, just shown a little bit differently in uh, from up to date. These are the four that I'd say are important. So pregnant women are at greater risk of impaired consciousness, hypoglycemia, pulmonary edema, edema, and severe anemia. The anemia, pregnant women are already prone to anemia. So there's the nutritional demand, there's reduced red blood cell lifespan, but also that placental sequestration, all of your red blood cells are sitting in the placenta so they don't contribute to any gas exchange or oxygen transport. And then hypoglycemia. Pregnant women are already at risk of hypoglycemia through enhanced beta cell function and hyperinsulinemia. But you add malaria on top of that, you have the parasite glucose requirements, you have maternal glucose requirements with febrile illness, and then you have decreased liver glycogen stores because uh, the pregnant woman is not uh, eating or drinking, or they may be vomiting. And just on top of that all, quinine used to be the, or was the main treatment for malaria in the first trimester, which we know causes hypoglycemia. So you really have this perfect storm for hypoglycemia, which you must be vigilant for. And then hyperparasitemia. We know hyperparasitemia is a contributor to severe malaria. We know it is not the be all and end all. And on that note, parasitemia may actually be low. Again, all those red blood cells are sitting in the placenta. In a study from Tanzania of 415 pregnant women, with active placental malaria infection, 46% of them did not have any peripheral parasitemia. So just to go back to malaria, pregnancy, and HIV, you can see here um, in this study from 2004, it was a systematic review, maternal malaria is more likely during pregnancy in women that are HIV positive. The same is true for maternal malaria at delivery, and the same is true for placental delivery. You can see the relative risks are all between 1.5 and 1.6 in women with HIV. Also, this is another Kenyan study. You can see here no infection. Mater these are the maternal birth weights. Those are squares of primiparous uh, women, triangles are multiparous women. And you can see here HIV alone, we know reduces birth weight. Malaria alone reduces birth weight in primigravity, not in multigravity because they have that those antibodies to VAR2 CSA but with dual infection, much lower birth weights in both uh, primiparous and multiparous women, and the same for maternal anemia, much lower base mean HB than in those without infection. And just again, together, there's an increased risk of, of uh, preterm delivery and stillbirth, and then low for gestational age and low APGAR scores. So what about the effects of malaria on pregnancy itself? So we know that it leads to poor pregnancy and poor fetal outcomes. So the poor pregnancy outcomes, more maternal mortality, miscarriages, IUFDs, and preterm deliveries. And if you look at maternal mortality in, in the Gambia during malaria season, malaria increases maternal mortality by 168%. This is most likely due to anemia because the proportion of deaths due to anemia increased up to threefold. Same as in Mozambique, malaria accounted for 15% of maternal deaths in one Mozambican study. And another subsequent uh, well, a subsequent prospective autopsy study showed that there was a very high rate of plasmodium falciparum infected erythrocytes in the small capillaries of the central nervous system in women who died during pregnancy. There are poor fetal outcomes as well. One that I want to just highlight is neurodevelopmental delays. So this is a study in Benin where they followed up kids up to six years of age, born to moms who had malaria during pregnancy, and these kids were more likely to have cognitive learning and processing impairment. So as much as malaria and pregnancy is a problem for us treating women at, you know, right now, you've got to think of their fetuses who will eventually become members of society, and this may affect them later in life. So how do we make the diagnosis? So it's no different to outside of pregnancy. Look at your symptoms and your lab signs. So symptoms are malaise, body aches and pains. Fever is quite common. In endemic areas, fever is less, is less common, but in areas if you have fever and you've traveled to malaria area, think malaria. And in lab diagnosis, microscopy, so that's your thick and thin blood smears, uh, that, that's PCR, I couldn't find anything better, PCR. And then this is a malaria rapid test. Remember in our setting, the malaria rapids only test for plasmodium falciparum. Well, I don't know if that's changed, yeah. So it's only plasmodium falciparum. So think, so don't rely on your rapid if someone has come 
you know, from holiday in Southeast Asia or certain parts of Africa where Vivax and Ovale may be prevalent. In terms of management, prevention is better than cure. So the first step to preventing malaria in pregnancy is don't go to a malaria area. Easy peasy. If you're not bitten by a mosquito that has plasmodium in it, you're not going to get malaria. The second step in preventing malaria in pregnancy is don't travel to a malaria area. If you're not bitten by a mosquito that's infected by plasmodium, you're not going to get malaria. If you insist on traveling or if you have to travel for certain reasons, then recommend DEET containing insect, insect repellent. This is not an advert for peaceful sleep or tabard. Uh, they just both contain DEET and they are easy pictures to find on the internet. Mosquito nets are really important. This picture is from Vanity Fair. She is not using that mosquito net effectively. This lady is using the mosquito net effectively. It is insecticide treated and it is tucked under the mattress or it can be down to the floor. But, you know, clever mosquito is just going to go in underneath. Don't rely on Vanity Fair for your medical information. And then just basic things. Don't go outside at nighttime, wear long sleeve clothes. An air conditioner or fan is very effective. And then use room sprays or insecticide candles. DEET containing products are safe to use in pregnancy. If you must travel, there are three drugs recommended in the NICD guidelines, mefloquine, which is larium, doxycycline, and then atovaquone progonol, which is melanol or melarone. Unfortunately, doxy and atovaquone aren't recommended for use in pregnancy. And to make matters worse, you can't actually get mefloquine in South Africa anymore. So, yeah, so no crazy larium dreams if, anymore. So we're a bit stuck. There is a systematic review, though, that has shown that atovaquone progonol may be safe to use in pregnancy. Uh, from the limited available data, the rates of um, adverse pregnancy outcomes, so specifically congenital anomalies, are essentially the same in similar populations. The UK Teratology Information Service advises that atovaquone progonol is not recommended, but if it is used, you give um, high-dose folic acid because progonol is a folate antagonist. In terms of treating malaria, consider your supportive measures. So monitor glucose, as you've spoken about the hypoglycemia, judicious use of fluids. You don't want to overload the patient and give her pulmonary edema, but you don't want to dehydrate her and have to call Professor Paget to dialyze. Urine output and renal function monitoring are important as well, and then respiratory support as needed. When talking about drug therapy, this is an older guideline, and by older, I mean June last year recommending quinine and clindamycin in the first trimester, and then artemisinin-based therapies, so that's your artemithalumafantrine, and then artesanate in all cases of severe malaria. So just highlighting that, we know that quinine is not a great drug. It causes hypoglycemia, has a whole bunch of other problems to go with it. So when we're looking at the different drugs available, chloroquine, not great for malaria, safe in pregnancy, but there's so much chloroquine resistance now, no one really uses it, especially in our setting. Quinine, safe in pregnancy, kills malaria, but has a lot of side effects. And then artesanate and artemitha, a little bit problematic. Until June last year, the WHO guidelines strongly recommended using quinine and clindamycin in the first trimester, specifically because co-artem wasn't safe. But fast forward about nine months later, and there's now a strong recommendation for treatment in the first trimester of pregnancy to use artemitha lumefantrine containing drugs. And the reason for that is this systematic review, which, as you can see here, looking at all outcomes, so composite outcome, favored artemisinin-based therapy, miscarriage in the first trimester, favored artemisinin-based therapy, uh, embryo-sensitive periods, so that's your very early weeks of pregnancy, stillbirth favors ABT, fetal loss favors ABT, and major congenital anomalies favors ABT as well. And then if we go into comparing artemitha lumefantrine with quinine specifically, all areas favored artemitha or coartem. The only thing they couldn't study is major congenital anomalies because there were no events in either group. Just a note on relapse therapy. So if your patient has VVAX or ovale, you need to give them primaquine to prevent relapse from that hypnozoid phase. The problem is primaquine is not safe in pregnancy. The reason for this is even though you can assess mom's G6PD status, so we know primaquine plus G6PD deficiency leads to hemolysis. You can't assess the fetus's G6PD status. So it's recommended to give it after delivery. So marathon session, in summary, 
Malaria is a major cause of global morbidity and mortality, and preventing malaria is key in pregnancy. There are adverse pregnancy outcomes. There are adverse malaria outcomes. So they all they play a role on each other. HIV and malaria have adverse effects on each other. A third of pregnant women in South Africa are HIV positive. So that's something really important to consider in the summer months. And treatment of malaria in pregnancy is the same as in non-pregnant adults now. So no longer need quinine and clindamycin in the first trimester. Go for coartum. It is recommended by the WHO. And just as I always do, I like to finish on this. It's, the, it's from the Embrace, uh, which is the maternal death reporting in the UK. Treat women who may become pregnant, are pregnant, or have recently been pregnant, the same as a non-pregnant person, unless there is a very clear reason not to. When you are seeing a pregnant woman with a medical problem, think to yourself, what would I do if she was not pregnant? And even better, think to yourself, what would I do if this patient was male? We need to train you guys how to treat pregnant women with medical problems. Uh, work as a multidisciplinary team. The maternal fetal medicine specialists, obstetricians are really experienced at treating this. They do it all the time. And then recognize the abnormal. And please don't gatekeep. If you get called to see someone who is pregnant, don't moan about having to go to block one. You are the experts in medical problems. You have the expertise, and that is why you have been called. So go and see the patient and collaborate with the MDT. These are my picture credits. There are lots of pictures. And that is it.